Congratulations, Pam, on your new representation by Pace Gallery. We're talking to you in your preparation for your first exhibition with them. The exhibition's called A Handful of Dust. Who came up with that title and why? <laughs> Originally, it was a throwaway set of words that I had jotted down a couple of months ago. And it was just a sort of notion of the sort of humble nature of where paintings come from, sort of pigment, paint, canvas, linen. It also sort of references T.S. Eliot's poem and Dolly Parton did a song and even more, this book called A Handful of Dust. So there's sort of many uses already from that. Um, and I thought all of a sudden it clicked and I thought actually that's perfect um, for the title of the show. And is the show a series of new works? Yes, it's all new. During my time at Porthmore in Cornwall, I was very ambitious down there, made a big body of work, and since then I've been making more work in mind for the exhibition. So some of them were made in Cornwall? Yes, yeah. And that's where you started working on such a large scale? Forbes designed the studio initially, he was a painter, and then John Wells moved in um, later on. And that studio was sort of designed for plein air painting. It was completely made of glass originally. The sort of weather was penetrating, but with protection. And I was really drawn by that whole sort of concept. Um, and now it's less of completely made of glass because the elements are too intrusive, uh, were too intrusive temperature-wise during the summer. But Anchor is a fantastic studio with this huge view over New Lynn. Um, and the fishing harbour and that's where I was able to make really quite large-scale paintings. How generally does one of your works come into being? Do you make sketches? Do you choose your colour scheme in advance? Um, so I do a lot of drawing although for the, for the last few months I haven't um, because I had this long period of time where I was drawing Cornwall. From doing all that drawing it lended itself into my memory um, and my t touch sort of in an automatic sense, but it was strangely trained. And then when I went to the canvases, there was sort of this notion from those drawings delivered, but it wasn't a planned entry. It was actually something much more loose. Um, so the drawings kind of helped um, have a way in when I was working on such a larger scale. So do you have something representative in mind or is it purely abstract and expressionistic? My interest is all landscape painting based. Um, I'm sort of very into Mirandi and painters like that, so Turner even, I, that's who I really look at. But my painting is very, very different, obviously, that language. But I think what Mirandi said was nothing's more abstract than reality. And I think that's always been in the back of my mind. So it takes from it takes from the everyday, but it's it's much more sort of an event rather than depicting. Mm -hmm. So when people liken your work to like a continuation of abstract expressionism, is that is that not how you feel about your own work? Um, well, I, I I definitely take interest in the conversations going around at that time with those painters, and I think. Um, I think that my paintings sort of don't give everything immediately and abstract expressionism at that time had this notion of everything should be available um, on the surface and I think then painters like Lee Krasner, Frank and Thela sort of maybe took that into a conversation that was uh, more about it slowly growing on you and it sort of unravelling over time. I'm, I'm very aware of what they did and I'm sort of still tapping into what they talked about then and bringing that conversation into today. And you say unravelling with time, I mean you spend months on, on a work and you make so many layers and then take them yeah. away again and put more on. I mean how long typically or is that like the length of a piece of string? Um, well sometimes it's years, previous paintings have just lingered and I haven't known what to do with them and sometimes it's about six months I suppose is the general amount of time I, I like to have because um, it's not for me it's not always about sort of applying the paint it's sometimes the action is just sitting and looking mm -hmm. so I, I, that that's very important that I have both. I think I read somewhere where you said that the act of looking was more important than the act of painting. Yeah yeah I like to spend a long time just looking and 
trying to understand the nature of t the touch and being sort of sensitive to that. Mm -hmm. And what kind of touch? I mean, what tools do you use? I am a bit of a purist. I just use brushes. Sometimes I use spatulas to scrape away sort of layers of paint just to, get to, t uh, to take it back to s uh, the start almost. Um, I remember reading that Matisse used to scrape whole paintings off and then there'd be this sort of ghost-like image um, left and then he'd rework it. Um, and I tried that myself and really thought it was a good way about making a painting. So are the accumulative traces part of the finished piece really? I'm sort of learning to allow very tentative, less finessed moments at the start um, have a presence in the finished painting. Because um, otherwise, I, what I used to tend to do is edit a lot. And now I'm learning that there's a lot to be said about that first, f that first mark and allowing it to stay, even though it might not be delivered in the best way. And how do you make that first mark? Do you colour the canvas at all first, or are you literally looking at a huge white space? Actually, I do lots of different things. I paint on many different surfaces. I, I do my surfaces mainly myself. Rabbit skin glue, depending on the layers of rabbit skin, um, it affects the, the absorbency of the surface. Um, and then sometimes I'll prime it. And, the primer in white pushes the paint forward, but if I decide not to do that, it sort of sinks. And then you're sort of constantly trying to sort of revive the colour from that, that surface. So I sort of do a bit of, bit of both. It sounds like it's very physical. Yeah, yeah quite physical. And you said about colour, uh, uh, you've said before about f creating found colours. Yeah. What, what did you mean by that exactly? Um, so with me, for, with colour, it's not something I um, obsess about. I like it to be very open. Um, but the choice that I made a few years ago was to mainly work in pots. Um, by doing so, there's a sort of accumulative um, nature to the way that the colours sit in the studio. and. Um, there's this contamination that I actually enjoy. I don't do it on purpose. I do actually try and keep tidy, although that doesn't happen. Um, and that cross-contamination is always interesting. So I sort of allow it and sort of go with that. And you, normally it's, it's much more interesting than actually making a colour. And you're talking about a lot of decisions and editing processes, but you've also said that the paintings become like sentient beings who direct you. Is that kind of a conversation or who's in charge? Who's, who's in charge? <laughs> I love that. Um, um, oh, that's a really interesting question. Um, so I would say that the, at the beginning, I would say that there's sort of neutral playing field. Um, the start is always very daunting. And I think that taking a distance and trying to observe as much more than dictate is a position I like to be in. But sometimes when you're frustrated or when you're trying to push your painting into what you think it should look like, that's when you think you've got this sort of upper hand with the painting. Um, but actually it's much more interesting when you step back and just allow it to, to act how it, how it's, what's going on there and then. Um, so very fluid, really. Mm. So this is probably a really horrible question that everyone asks. And how do you know when you're finished with the work? Um, so with my paintings, I think that there's lots of different types of finished. Um, what's, what I like to do is sometimes finish can be every aspect of that surface is completely filled and loaded and it's almost sort of overly done, overly finished. Um, like in the painting Deluge, there's a sort of cascade of information and mark where it's almost combusting with overload. Whereas with Hidden Scene, it's actually all about the lines that don't quite meet, the sort of voids. And I think that both can exist as being finished. And so those extremities in the show is something I've been um, being sensitive to. And you mentioned a couple of your titles just now. Where, what, what point does a work get its title? Yeah. Um, 
So with titles, I, it's something that I like to spend as much time as possible. Um, not all of them are titled yet. There's, I sort of have this ongoing list and it's been going on for years. Um, and I, it, it sort of it assists the work's progression. Um, and then eventually that, that title will land on a work. Um, but it's just something I take my time with. This painting in particular is leaning on drawing more than the other paintings where the drawn line does become enveloped into the mark of the paint. And this painting's more about reduction, removal, this feeling of scraping everything back where the gesture is more precise in a way. And I was sort of looking at Matthew Wong's recent show at Massimo Di Carlo and those ink drawings that he was making um, and there was these sort of marks that were left so sort of, un, sort of untouched. It was sort of that one notion, that one mark, so perfectly done, but because it, it exposed um, elements of um, even apprehension, and he allowed that to remain in the mark. So I was really taken by that. And I was also at the time looking at Robert Ryman and how his sort of white paintings, even though it's just basically white, there's this sort of maximum level of information um, from this sort of very minimal approach. And I'm, I'm sort of always thinking about work like that in the back of my head, even when I'm doing those very loaded, larger paintings. Um, so this is a sort of leaning on that way of making for me that also is just as important. So the brush marks, for example, you, you've done just like sweeps, like as if you were drawing a, a line yeah. of charcoal or something, maybe. Yeah, so scale as well. You know, I, I like to think that even though I'm working on a wall a lot of the time with these canvases, um, unless, you know, like a window such as Turner would, um, it, this could be a piece of paper in, in its notion of how it's been paint, sort of uh, my application to it. Um, but it's, you know, it is large and it means that the gesture's even more exaggerated and I think that can expose even, even more uncertainty at times but also a level of conviction um, in applying yourself to that scale. It seems like there's a lot of sort of contradictions and push and pull and yeah. adding and taking away. Yeah, look, that's so, so true. There is a lot of contradictions and at first I used to be very frustrated about the tensions in my painting and I sort of felt like that, that because there's this sort of inevitable collapse that happens when I'm painting and because of this I tend to have to paint alone and be on my own in the studio for a long period of time um, because I, f I sort of found that very painful that whole process but now I'm sort of realizing that these coll collapses these existential collapses within the painting are actually necessary um, and I sort of, I'm, I'm sort of allowing these tensions to exist at different stages with these works. So do you have a particular routine in the studio? Like, do you work in silence or...? Yeah, so I, so I used to work in pure, like complete silence and I'm, I'm not someone that... I like music but I don't go out and have earphones in. Um, I like to be sensitive to what's going on around me and I used to apply that into the studio um, but because for a few years now I have been very much on my own in the studio, this one and others, um, I think to, to battle sometimes loneliness, which is important but also hard, um, music has been quite essential. And does the music feed into the, the gestures you're making? Well, I try to, it gives an attitude. Um, it depends who you're listening to. Um, but uh, it can give an attitude, but I actually tend to try and avoid listening to things that are too intrusive at times, because um, it can affect the focus. And talking of focus as well, you've got canvases behind this one that are turned to the wall. I mean, is that something you do? Yes, yeah, so because the paintings themselves, they ask for a lot of attention. Normally I'll focus on one painting for a while, 
then it's sort of discarded and it's turned to the wall into a stack and I forget about it and that's really essential because you kind of I tend to want a blindness to my work and if I become too familiar it's I sort of end up seeing what I want to see instead of what's actually going on yeah